Well, we thank God for another opportunity to enter into his word. The word of God said it's the entrance of his word that brings light. It's bringing understanding to the simple. And so we thank God that we have an opportunity to enter into his word. We just worship him and we glorify him. And we just, I just thank God that I have an opportunity to enter into his presence. But he is a good God, a great God, an awesome God, wondrous to behold. And I thank God that we have made it thus far in this year. And what God has started, he's going to finish. And so we just thank God for that. And so we're going to start a new series today, which, kind of, which is kind of a, a continuation of what we already have been talking about. We just recently was talking about the benefits of speaking in tongues. And there is a method and there is a road that we're walking down where God is taking us. And there is a road that God is taking us. And so what we want to understand is this. God, in this new time, in this season, people are looking for a move of God. They're looking for God's presence. You know, people, we, we, we talk about the church. We talk about a church, the body of Christ, serving an all-powerful God, serving a God who stepped out on nothing and said, let there be, and it was. That's the God that we serve. And so they're looking for a demonstration of that spirit's power also in the church. And what has happened is a lot of times they come to the church, and I always say this, people come to the church and they leave the same way they came. Week after week after week, they never experience an encounter with God. No, we have good word. No, word is preached. People get born again. Praise the Lord. Every now and then, someone gets healed. Praise God. But his expectation is that it be a regular occurrence with the body. And so people are looking for God's presence. They're searching for God. Now we serve the true and the living God. If, they, if we don't present them the truth, they will accept a counterfeit. And so it's been said that a lot of people are leaving the church. And even been suggested that is the church going to decline, diminish in America? I disagree. Because Jesus already said that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. And so the church is not going in these last days, it's not going to be diminished. It's going to be, it's going to flourish. Does that mean everybody that comes to the church is going to be a part of that? No. But there is going to be a demonstration of God's spirit because the word of God said that the glory of the latter house is going to be greater than the former. When we said, and I always say this, when we look at the book of Acts, there's not an amen or a period there because it didn't end. We're still operating in the book of Acts. It says the Acts of the Apostles is actually the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the Apostles. And so the Holy Spirit hasn't stopped working. So it is not over. And so we got to understand this. As people are coming to us, they're coming looking for God. When they come to the church, will they find him? When they approach us, whether it's the four walls of this building or any church building, if they come because the Bible said we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, when they come, will they find God when they have an encounter with us? Who are God's servants? whom the Spirit of God lives inside. That's why it's important that we pray in tongues. That's why it's important that we pray in the Spirit. We pray with our understanding. We worship in the Spirit. We worship in understanding. Because it's in preparation for when the world encounters a man or a woman full of God's Spirit, who know who they are. People who know their God. And as a result, they do great exploits. That's who the world is looking for. 
And so we're going to start talking today about the the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Like I said, there is a place in which we're going with this, with these series of teachings. The anointing of the Holy Spirit. Because you've heard it said, and and people say, well, church unusual and all of that. And you hear year after year, year after year, year after year, church unusual. But then it's still church as usual. We come in, we have nice praise and worship. Nice sermons, but no hearts change. People's lives are not impacted the way God wants to. Why? Because the anointing's not there. To the level that God desires. And understand this. We're not just talking about the preachers. Because the truth of it is the power and the strength of any move of God doesn't come from the pulpit, it comes from the pew. When you see a church that suddenly explodes and suddenly there are people that are coming, man, they just had a hundred and boom, they just blew up to 2,000 people. How did that happen? It didn't come from the pew. Because that's the same man. He didn't suddenly become this great orator that everybody just dying to see. It was the people who grabbed hold of the vision of the ministry, who grabbed hold of the anointing of the Holy Spirit, and they went out and got got people and brought them into the ministry. The blaze and the strength of any fire in a church comes from the pew, not from the pulpit. Oftentimes we put it on the ministers and all of that, but that's not really where it comes from. The ministers and the pastors, yes, they give direction. They're the visionary. They cast the vision. But it's the people that actually see the fulfillment of the vision and help it come to pass, working with God. And so the Lord wants us, the body, to be anointed. These signs shall follow those that believe. In Mark 16. He didn't say the signs will follow the fivefold ministry gifts. He didn't say the signs will just follow the pastor or the prophet or the evangelist or the teacher. He said the signs will follow the believer. And if we are a believer, then the signs should follow everyone that names the name of Christ. That is a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Signs, wonders, and miracles. To follow everybody. But we put it all on the ministry guests and say, well, it's just for the church leaders. It's not. It's for everybody. And so God is trying to get us to a place where the body grabs hold and we have a bunch of anointed people going out into the community and affecting change in the community. Affecting change on your job. Affecting change because of the anointing. Affecting change wherever we go. That's what God is looking for. That's what he's searching for. He's searching for a man and a woman who is faithful. Who will do what he has called them to do. Turn over to Joel, the second chapter. Joel, or Joel, the second chapter. Verse 28. Because these days was prophesied even before Jesus came. The days that we're living in were prophesied even before Jesus came. So God was already in preparation for what we are encountering right now. So it wasn't a surprise. It wasn't his plan B. He knew it was coming all along. God is never caught by surprise. He's never thrown off guard and said, oh, something will happen. Oh, this didn't happen the way I thought it was going to happen. Now I got to go. I got to let me change everything. He always knew. He was always preparing. He knew that in 2019 slash 2020, there are going to be a people crying out for him. There are going to be a people looking for God in America. Looking for God in Africa. Looking for God in Europe. 
looking for God in Asia. People that are looking for God. Over here. Turn, let's go back. Actually start at verse 25. It says this. It says, I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten and the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm and my great army which I sent among you. And you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that has dwelt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. God is saying this. The things that we saw, the things that we lost, the things that the enemy came in and destroyed, God said, I'm going to restore. He's talking about the church. Whatever it is that you lost, whatever it is that the enemy came in and destroyed. Now, it says here that I sent. What we got to understand is God didn't do it he just withdrew his hand. When we don't flow in the anointing, when we don't always follow what God says, it opens us up for the curse. The curse is already out there. God could have us fenced in to protect us from the curse, but if we open the door, guess what? The curse can come in. And, he, and the enemy will come in and still kill and destroy because we opened the door. But God said, guess what? I'm going to restore. I'm going to restore. He said, and the things you lost, you're going to have in plenty. He says this, and you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and I am the Lord your God, and none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. Isn't it strange that we as the church, one of the things I see all the time is how we struggle. as the church, as God's people. I remember one time I was dealing with a brother and we were dealing with a, per situation, a certain situation and he's, he, his response was, how'd you end up like that? I mean, he's mocking me. He's almost like, look at you. Aren't you supposed to be a Christian? Aren't you supposed to be God's man? How did this happen? And we know we face people all the time. There are times they're saying, even our co-workers and people, they, they know, man, you, don't you go to church? Don't you believe in God? Don't you do this? Don't you do that? Yeah, all that, all that junk you talk about your God, how did this happen? How did you end up like this? How come you in need? God said, my people will never be ashamed. He said, I'm going to set you up so that you will never be ashamed. That's what God is trying to get the church to. That we don't have to up beg and all of that where we know our God and we know God's going to supply my need. So we ain't going to be ashamed. And so here we say that he said, never be ashamed. Verse 28 says, and it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your old men shall dream dreams. And your young men shall see visions. And, upon, and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and, ver and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance. And the Lord has said in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. God is saying in the last days. Are we in the last days? He said it shall come to pass. He's going to pour out his spirit upon all flesh. Are we flesh? Yes. So God is looking to pour out his spirit. He is looking for us to prophesy. He is looking for us to dream dreams and have visions. He is looking for his church, his body, that when people come and they don't have an answer, we have one. Let me tell you. And it's not always, wait a minute, let me call my pastor. They're looking at it from you.
They're looking for the anointing to flow through you. Not your pastor. They assume your pastor's anointed. But what about you? Because here's really, a lot of times, they'll say behind your back or they're thinking, but they're not saying it. They're thinking, you've been inviting me to your church. Well, I, I would assume your pastor's anointed. He's a man of God. I assume she's the woman. Of God. She's a woman of God. But you've been going there for five years. You've been going there for ten years. Why don't you know anything? What about you? Because you're inviting me to. If it ain't affecting you, then why should I come? If you've been going five years, ten years, and the anointing is not flowing through you, why are you saying, I should take the time to come? If it's not impacted your life, if there's not been a change in your life. You know, I was talking to a brother not too long ago, and we were talking about, he was sharing with me another brother he was having a conversation with, one we used to go to go to church with we do no we done ministry outreach and stuff like that and he was having a conversation with them and he said this he said man when I finished having the conversation I realized this he is thinking the same way he was 20 years ago it's been 20 years he said it probably been about 10 to 10 or so years since he has last talked to the guy but about 20 years since we've been we worked in the ministry together he said he said, and all this time, and he's been at the same church, and he said, all this time, he's thinking the same way. Nothing's changed. He's not even grown a bit. He's still a child in the Word based on his conversation. That means he's wasted 20 years of his walk with God. Something's wrong. Something's wrong when we have people that come to church week after week and they come one year, two years, five years, ten years, and they're the same way and the church is the same powerless church that it was when it first started. Something's wrong. We, we're missing it somewhere. Because if there's not a change, the problem is not God. So the problem is, Lord, where are we missing it? Heard a pastor say this one time, and I, I agree with him. He said, for a lot of churches, we need to close the doors and write on the front, Ichabod, the glory of the Lord has departed. Because there's no glory there. God's anointing is not there. We go through the motions of church. But we don't See, you can learn how to do church stuff. We can hire a band. None of them have to be born again, but they're, they're skilled at what they do. Skilled guitar player, skilled keyboard player. And I say, this is what we want in praise and worship. And guess what? They can deliver on cue. And we were oh man, the power of God was there. And the people playing the instruments don't even know God. The people singing don't even know God. That's why you can have a person who's not born again jump on a gospel album and suddenly everybody goes crazy. Oh, did you hear this? But God ain't in it. That was just money to them. But the world is looking for a people that know their God, that is anointing, where the power of God shows up. Because see, when we talk about church unusual, when we talk about a move of God, when we talk about the glory of the latter rain, it is not going to be for everybody. Because everybody really don't want the anointing. Because with that comes a responsibility and accountability. And some people, I want God, I just want God my way. I want to go to heaven, but I want to go to heaven my way. Somebody and I know this is bad, but somebody asked me. They were talking about this person, real famous person, who died not 
this past year and all of that. And what do you think? And I, I, I didn't say anything. I didn't say anything. Because they wanted to ask me, what do you think about them? I wanted to tell them, yeah, they went to hell. In hell, they lifted up their eyes. Based on their lifestyle, they didn't know God. Oh, yeah, this is a great man, and he did all of this and all that, but he didn't know God. Yeah, according to your standards, he was a good person. But Jesus said there's none good but God. So the person can be a good person, do some great things in the community, some good things in the community. But if they don't know God, and the thing that is going to distinguish in these last days between the real and the counterfeit is going to be the anointing. Because there are people that are going to church and people that are saying, God is here. Here is God over here. And let me show you our theology that doesn't line up with scripture. And some of them can do some things supernaturally. That don't mean it's God. I'm reminded of a young man story I heard where a young man was a missionary and he's in this country he was in Africa and people were getting born again but there was also this witch doctor and the witch doctor had bewitched the people and the Bible talks about someone like that in the book of Acts and so what ended up happening was, which I could say, well, my God's powerful than you. I got more power than you do. Tell you what, let's have a showdown. We're going to see. Let the God then answer. That's who the, pe that's who the people are going to go with. And so the young man's and preparing and all of that and so the day come where they're standing there before the people and suddenly the witch doctor levitates off the ground this, no, this is no fake phony nut, there's no wires there, there's nothing, there's not no David Copperfield or nothing, no magician's trick, this is the power of the devil being demonstrated And so, and obviously the people see this and they're going, wow, this is some great power and all of that. And the young man is sitting there saying, he's praying and he's saying, while he's, this is happening, he's saying, Lord, what do I do? What do I do to, to outdo this? And the Lord just says, stop him from doing what he's doing. And he just said, in the name of Jesus, stop. And the guy dropped like a rock. Tried to levitate again, couldn't. Tried to levitate again, couldn't. He took his power away. Let the God who answers by fire be God. And there are a lot of counterfeits running out there saying this is God. And some of them can demonstrate their God. while we cower in our four walls because we can't demonstrate the true and the living God. They know their God. But we don't know ours. But it was the anointing that allowed him to stop the works of the devil. And that's what God is trying to take the church. When we look at our community and we see death after death, young person killing another young person, here's another murder, here's another murder, the anointing can destroy all of that. 
Here it is. In the city of Durham, there are over 350 churches. But all of this crime, all of these murders, Because we are not moving the anointing. We'll get church services. But we need a rising up of God's people who are anointed. Not just the pastor. Not just the ministry guests. Not just the preachers. But the men and the women of God who know their God whose anointing, God's anointing is on them so that we can go in there, that when we go into a community, we go out to worship, the power of God shows up. I talked to somebody recently, one of my family members, they whole time talking about generational curses and all of that. And I said, that's a lie. I don't receive that at all. Yeah, you can talk generational curses, but what you're saying then is you got all of these in my, this is my extended family, who are supposed to be Christians, who are supposed to be spirit-filled, that are yielding to the devil. What you mean generational curses? When we're full of God's spirit. When we get born again, the spirit of God comes and lives inside of us. If the spirit of God lives inside of us, why would we be subjective to the devil and powerless to encounter him and defeat him? He said, I don't believe that. I ain't receiving that at all. Now, if you want to walk in that, and that's your confession, go right ahead. We don't deny that the enemy is there. We don't deny the effects, but we deny the power that he has power over us to stop us from doing what God has called us to do. Turn over to Acts chapter 2. This is Peter saying the same thing. Acts chapter 2, verse 16. Out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. So God is established that the day that Joel had talked about had finally arrived. Thousands of years ago, when Joel spoke that by the Spirit of God, that this day would come. God is saying, guess what? This day has arrived. Where the power of God now is made available to his believers, his people, to exercise in the earth. So over here it says, and this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. This is Peter speaking, preaching. And it shall come to pass in the last day, says God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And all my servants and all my handmaids, I will pour out on these days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapors of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon into blood before that great and terrible day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What Joel prophesied, God said, now it's here. And so our expectation should be that we're do, ex- exercising exactly what God said. Our young men, our young Lord, they should be prophesying. We're not just talking teenagers. Why can't children do it? God can move through children that know their God, that have yielded to him. That's why it's important that we, as parents, that we teach our children to pray and to seek God and to hear from God. Well, they won't sit down and listen. They sit down in school. You 
Why would we expect them? I don't, I don't understand that. That they come to church and they run around the church and everything. Well, I can't get them to sit down. But then if they go to school, you better sit down and listen to that teacher. You better not be running around class. What's wrong with you? Teacher can't teach. You bet, if I have to come down there, we're going to have a problem. So you better sit down and listen to your teacher. We'll say that in school, but we don't in church. And what are we telling them? That school is more important than church. That the world is more important than God. We're okay. They'll be in, in church on, on their tablets, on their electronic devices. Everything has nothing to do with God, but we, they better not dare do that in class. You better pay attention to your teacher while we're telling them the things of this world is more important than the things of God. When the Bible says they should prophesy, they should be dreaming dreams and having visions. God didn't mean, didn't say it just for the adults. He said it is for the believer. And when our children get born again at some point, we should be on an ongoing basis preparing them for the anointing. Just like we're preparing ourselves. Because God never ordained for it just to be come from the pulpit only. He ordained for He ordained for every believer, all of us, to do the work together. Understand this. That the anointing of the Holy Spirit is available for us individually as well as corporately. Individually to do service outside of the church. Then corporately for there to be a move of God inside the church. The four walls of the church. And so God has made the anointing available for everyone that desires it. But understand this. You all are going to experience as much of the anointing as you want. As much as you will yield to, as much as you're saying, God, I'm willing, God, I present myself, God, do what you will. But you're only going to experience as much of it as you want. Most people, when it comes to the things of God, they only get as much as they want, as much as they make themselves available for. So you got people that, I want to see a move of God. I want to see God raise the dead and all that. Okay, what are you doing to prepare for it? We say we want it in our church. We say we want to move with God in our church, but what are we doing to prepare for it? We have God on the clock. Our service is only going to be an hour and a half. We got it down. We got it nailed down to a minute. This praise and worship is going to be this long. This is going to be this long. This is going to be this long. That's why without praise and worship, I'm telling you, man, I don't... We'll finish when we finish. Well, I think praise and worship is going, it's too long. And we'll finish when we finish. When the Holy Spirit says we're done, we're done. When we minister, we minister. And when we say we're done, we're done. We, get, we put God on the clock, but we want to move with God. We want the anointing to flow, but we put God on the clock. What if it takes God, by the time we get into a position to receive, instead of being instead of being two hours, it's three hours. Will you hang in there? Or are we looking on our clock and saying, oh, you know, um, well, Pastor, Pastor, man, we got this long-winded preacher. If you really believe that you, you that God is going to show up and your heart's desire is to get what you say you want, Time is not of the essence. God, I'm willing to wait. You know, I was watching a football game. You know, I, you know, I like sports and all that. I was watching a football game last night. And this game started at 8 o'clock, a little bit after 8. 
And it didn't finish till, I don't know, about 11.30, 12. I watched it on and off, but I know, about 12 o'clock. That's four hours. That you got people cheering for, for a team that if that team won, they get nothing out of it and say, my team won. Okay, what else did you get? Well, my team won. Okay. How did that improve your life? What did it do for you? Well, my team won. Okay, what did it do for you? How did it benefit you other than out of pride? You get to say, my team won. Guess what? Eventually, your team is going to lose. So four hours. And a good game. Came down to the end. You didn't see anybody leave and say, man, phew, this game's too long. I wish, man, they need to cut some time off of this. I wish this game was over. Man, it's four hours. I got, I'm ready to go to bed. I'm tired. You don't see anybody doing that with a football or a basketball game. But when it comes to the church and the things of God, when it comes to the true riches, things that have, carry an eternal weight, we want to put it on the clock, but we want the anointing. See, the anointing is made available corporately. So what we should see happen corporately is a result of what, we, what is taking place individually. One come in has a song. One has a word. But together, there is a word from God and a move of God because we all come in on fire for God, full of the anointing. A lot of times the reason why it takes God so long is because he's waiting on us to get in a position where he can do something. And in most of our services, we never get there because we cut it short. We pray, Holy Spirit, have your way. We want to see a move of God, but we never give him time. Now, I'm not saying we got to go carry a service long because just for the sake of carrying a service long, I think we should be respectful of people's time. I've seen it where God moved and it didn't take long within an hour. Man, there have been times I've been in services where in the praise and worship, God moved. And in the hour's time, the pastor got up. I've been part of services like that where God said, God has moved. Ain't nothing for me, else for me to do. Holy Spirit already spoke. God, he, the people have already got what the Holy Spirit wanted to give. All right. Let's take our offering. Let's go home. And in an hour, we were out. Because the people came ready to receive from God. They came ready to move. And so from the very time praise and worship started, boom, there was an explosion. So the Holy Spirit, he moved quickly and he did what he wanted to do. Most of the time it drags on because the Holy Spirit said, man, Got to get them going. Oh, got to get them. Got to get her mind off of this. Got to get his mind off of this and get their mind on me and get them to go with me. And we never get to that point. In most services, we never get there. When we come together corporately, most times we never get there. We cut it short. Because we get into our little tradition. We get into our little box. We get into our little form where we know praise and worship is going to be 15, 20 minutes. You know, they're going to have their two fast songs, two slow songs, and it's over. Then they're going to do the offering. Then the pastor's going to preach. Then we're going home. You do an altar call, we go home. And we got it nailed down like a science to to an hour and a half. We know we started at 11. We're going to be done by 1230. Why? It's like that every week. We start at 10 o'clock, 1130. We're walking out the door. Why? It's like that every week. We set our clocks by. Man, I'm playing golf on Sunday. I'm going to set my tee time for 1230 because I know at, at 1130 I'm going to be out of church. It's going to take me 30 minutes to go home, get changed, and then by 12.30, I'm ready to tee it off while we set our clocks by it. 
because we don't come with an expectation that there's going to be a move of God. I remember one time, and this is just my introduction. I remember one time we was in a service, and you had people saying, wanting to be filled with the Spirit and all of that, and, and suddenly you could feel it building. Week after week, you could feel it building. Sunday school, there was a move of God. Church service, God, but you can feel it building. To finally, one Sunday, there was an explosion. But the explosion happened when the pastor got up to get ready to do the benediction. Everything is done. Offering, everything is done. One o'clock, he's getting ready to do the benediction, and suddenly God showed up. And we're there for another two hours. And nobody left. I thought you wanted God. I thought you wanted to see God move. I thought you wanted to be filled with the Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Guess what? It didn't happen between 11 and 1. It happened between 1 and 3. Nobody was tired. Oh, man, I'm tired from this service. Man, that was a long time. Everybody was walking out like, what, what it's 3 o'clock? God, it seemed like, man, it was that. We would end the church five hours. It don't, man, five hours? It wasn't planned by us, but it was planned by God. Now, we didn't have services like that every time. That was one where God showed up. And he says, I'm ready. You've been, you've been asking for me. Guess what? It's one o'clock. I know the pastor's getting ready. Guess what? I'm here. Now, those of you that you, you, you were just kidding about wanting me, uh, well, you can go ahead and leave. But those of you who are serious about me, guess what? I'm here. Are you willing to stay? Or are you on the clock? Because when we're talking about a move of God in the anointing, it may happen before 10 o'clock. We meet at 10. We start at 10. It may happen before 10. It may happen at 9. You know, we're praying from 9 to 9.30. It may happen at 9 o'clock. It may happen at 9.15. You may walk in, and God's already finished. And Pastor Carmen said, come up and say, hey, man, we're done. If you just get in here, you missed it. You missed it. Because when people are serious about the anointing. And they really want God. God's now not on the clock. Soon as we walk in, suddenly God, we find out God is waiting. Hey, I've been waiting all week for you all to get here. Let's go. Let's hit it. And boom, there's an explosion. Because when the anointing comes, it's going to destroy the yokes. And we're going to talk about the anointing some more. It's going to destroy the yokes. Everything that we walked in with, all the things that have been hindering us and keeping us from doing that, suddenly it's destroyed. Suddenly it falls off. God, I ain't even worried about that. Yeah, God, I did have plans today, but I, ain't, I forget the plans. God, I want you. So forget the plans. I don't care what I had planned today. It doesn't matter. We're not just talking Sunday. Man, why were you late for work? Well, I had a meeting. We don't tell my I mean, God showed up. Me and the meeting between me and God. I was trying to get up off the floor and go to work, but I couldn't because this presence was just so on me. I was trying, hey, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to be late, but I'm going to get there as soon as I can. Right, right now, I'm meeting with God. I can't wait to get off. Well, I got a meeting with God at 6 o'clock. I get off at 5. They're going to give me time to get home. And man, I can't wait to get into God's presence. Why? If we really want the anointing and we want to see a move of the Holy Spirit, we take God off the clock. God, I'm available. Um, it's 3 o'clock in the morning. 
son, let's talk. Let's fellowship. Oh, man, I just went to bed at 12. But suddenly at 3 o'clock you wake up and you're wide awake and you can't go back to sleep. And God is saying, come on, let's talk. When we want a move of the anointing and experience the Holy Spirit's presence, we take God off the clock. And we make ourselves available. We yield to him whenever he says, let's go. Because that's what the world is looking for. The world is looking for a people that know their God. They're coming to our churches, searching and seeking a people that know their God. They have a genuine hunger for the real. We ask the question sometimes, why aren't people coming to the church? Because they've already been. Because they've already been. We showed them everything but God. We showed them the denominational teachings. We showed them the teachings of men. We showed them our nice building, our nice facility. We showed them everything but God, the very thing they came looking for, the very person they came looking for, the very thing they came looking for. They came looking for the anointing. They came looking for the real. They came looking for God, and they saw everything but him. How many of y'all been to a concert before? Put your hands down. I don't want to put that out. Oh, we all been saved. Okay, you going to a concert to see your favorite singer. You paid your money. And you said, man, I can't wait. And you got prepared and you got ready. And you show up and they don't show. Yeah, I'm going to see, well, we know he's passed away now, but man, I can't wait to see Michael Jackson. I can't wait to see him and show up in this counterfeit. It's a lookalike. Man, I paid $100 to see Bay. I, see, I paid $100 to see her and it's a counterfeit. A lookalike. A pretend. The first thing you know, I want my money back. I didn't come for this. I didn't go through all this, and I didn't go through preparing and all of this for this. I came for the real person, and they threw me a counterfeit. Oh, she can sing and all that. I don't care if she can sing or not. She ain't the one I came looking for. I didn't come for a substitute. I came for the real. And we got to understand the world is tired of substitutes. They're tired of counterfeits. When they come to the church, they're tired of coming to the people who say they know God and only finding a substitute and a counterfeit. They want the real. And that's what God wants us to be. That when people come here, they see a people who are anointed, who know their God, that they would experience and have a God encounter. Where they know the presence of God is there. Where the healing power of God is there. The anointing to heal is there. The anointing for miracles and signs and wonders are there. The doctor said, my baby's going to die. There's nothing they can do. I don't know what to do. Honey, get them in the presence of God. Bring them to church on Sunday. Bring them to church at our midweek service. Bring them. God's there. And watch what God does. Instead of, honey, I'll pray for them. And the baby dies. 
Honey, bring them into the presence of God and watch what God does. That's what the church is for. That's what the anointing is for. And that's what God is trying to take us and the body of Christ in the last days. In these times, there is a cry from the world, from the ungodly, for the real. And it's going to be the anointing of the Holy Spirit that shows them the real. That's going to reveal what's real and what's true in these last days. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Father, in Jesus' name, we bless you. We honor you and we glorify your name. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for this day. It is a day that you've made, Heavenly Father, for us to come together to be instructed by your spirit. Father, our heart's cry is for the anointing to be poured out upon us. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Just like Jesus said, your spirit is upon us. You have ordained, you have anointed, you have prepared us to preach the gospel to the poor. You have sent us to heal the brokenhearted. Father, there are people right now whose heart is broken. There are 